Maritime history is full of unexplained phenomenon and tall tales of sea monsters and you know mariners going out and returning in different parts of the world and not knowing how they got there. You've, you've abandoned ships. You have all these crazy things that happen out on the ocean. And many of them are just stories. We like to believe them because they're fascinating, but few of them actually hold up and, and, are, and are true. But one story, it is absolutely as fascinating as some of these very tall tales, but also happens to be true. Today, I'm gonna to cover that story, and it is the story of the lost Hawaiian fisherman. So the too long didn't read version of this story is you have five highly experienced Hawaiian fishermen that take off on a daytime fishing trip. The weather turns really bad while they're out in the water and they don't return. Despite an extensive search effort, they are not located. And after a year, the families and friends of the lost fishermen, they host, they host a memorial service and assume that their loved ones are gone forever. Nine years later, they make a discovery on a very small island 2300 miles away that calls into question the entire story. It's an amazing story, it's a tragic story, but it's one worth listening to right to the very end. Before we get started, if you are into strange and mysterious stories like the one I've just described, uh, my channel is going to be a bevy of content just like that. And so if you would, if you could gently liquid... <laughs> If you could gently liquid, I can't even say it. If you could gently liquidate the like button. <laughs> if you could like, if you could gently liquidate the like button and subscribe and turn on all notifications, that would be great. Scott Mormon was born in 1952 in the San Fernando Valley in California. At a young age, he loved the show Adventures in Paradise, which was about this crew of young sailors that would travel the South Pacific looking for adventure and passengers to pick up along the way. And it was just this brilliant show to him. And he became obsessed with living in the South Pacific when he got older. Specifically, he wanted to live in Hawaii. But that wouldn't necessarily happen right away because at a young age, he got married and had a son and stayed in California. But in 1975, he and his wife split up. And so he took that as an opportunity to go fulfill that childhood dream of living in Hawaii. And so he, on his own, his son stayed with his, his former wife. He, uh, Scott, moves out to the east coast of Maui on Hawaii. And he moves into this, this little town called Nahiku. Now, Nahiku was full of lots of native Hawaiians and a growing population of kind of like refugees in a way, you know, Vietnam veterans kind of that were over living in the mainland. You have hippies and kind of earth loving people that do a lot more partying than working. They were all kind of congregating in the same same town. And, and Scott, he loved that culture and he quickly became a part of it. But he also, uh, unlike a lot of the, the kind of hippies that made their way to Nahiku, uh, that were part of that growing population, Scott really wanted to kind of become a part of the, the whole culture of Nahiku because he really, he, he growing up, he loved Hawaii. He didn't want to be the kind of the others on the island. He wanted to be a part of the main culture. And so he took it upon himself to learn the sort of pidgin English that locals would use. Uh, he took time to learn some of the, the cultural traditions that they had and really went out of his way to try to befriend some of the locals. And while he wasn't really embraced as, you know, a kind of local he he did form a number of friendships with local hawaiians and in time he really felt like this is where he belongs this was home to him a hundred percent so he would only go back to california one time he goes back once for his son's birthday uh, and he also sees his parents while he's there and they are all pleading with him to come back you know be with your family they want him to stay and he says, no, Nahiku is where I belong and I can't envision myself living anywhere else. And so when he flies back after that one visit to California for his son's birthday, when he flies back to Nahiku, that would be the last time that his son, his former wife and his parents, his family uh, back in the mainland would, would see him. That's the last they would see him. On February 11th, 1979, Scott and four of his friends decide that they're not gonna go to work that day. They all worked construction together. 
Uh, instead, they're going to go fishing because they all love to fish and the weather was beautiful. So they said, why not? Now, none of them owned their own boat. So they had to ask a friend who had a 17 foot Boston whaler named the Sarah Joe. Uh, their friend allowed them to use it. And so they got their boat. They went to the store, got some beer, snacks, uh, and got some ice for their big ice chest so they could pack it with the fish they caught, that they hopefully caught, and they were on their way. The part of Hawaii that Scott and his friends lived in, the east coast of Maui, at the time did not get any TV stations and radio broadcasts were done maybe once a week uh, and were hard to pick up. So people in that area, especially fishermen and anybody that was out on the water, they were accustomed to going out without a weather report. They basically played the weather by their eye. They kind of just sized it up and said, does it seem okay? Okay, it seems good, and they would go out. Um, obviously, that's pretty risky, but the locals were pretty good at it, and Scott and his buddies uh, also were, were very good at this point at kind of reading the weather, and so they thought this day was gonna be just fine. Now, in order to get to the place where they intended to fish, they would need to pass through something called the Alanui Haha Channel which is considered to be one of the roughest and most dangerous areas for all sailors anywhere near Hawaii. So it's a dangerous place. It, it's at certain points, it is almost 7,000 feet deep. Uh, there's very strong surface currents. It's just a risky place to be if, for example, there was a big storm. Now, when Scott and the Sarah Joe crew took off, the water was calm, the weather was beautiful. And by about 10 a.m., when they believe they, they must have been in the channel at this point, the weather was still very calm. However, a low pressure system had picked up very suddenly between 10 and noon. And so when they probably were somewhere towards the end of the channel, when they were gonna be making their way into open water to fish, there was beginning to be torrential downpour all along the channel. Uh, and it eventually turned into a full scale hurricane. Um, so on the island, people described this particular storm as being one of the worst they've seen in 50 plus years. This is like a sudden, freak, horrible storm. Of the boats that took off to go fishing out of this east coast uh, section of Maui, there was four fishing boats that went out. Three returned. The one that didn't was, of course, the Sarah Joe. At 5 p.m., the Coast Guard is notified by their friends and family that they have not returned yet. Uh, the storm is still raging, you know, gale force winds, torrential downpour, but they still send out a plane to look overhead. A number of crews were sent out to go look for them, uh, even with the incredible risk of searching in this weather. But considering the dangers they were in, they decided it was necessary. The searchers who were in the boats, the, the boat crews that were sent out to look for the Sarah Joe crew, they said that at best they could see maybe 50 feet in front of them, and even that was a stretch. So it was, it was a limited search, but they did go out on the day of the storm. Over the next five days, the Coast Guard led a search that included 44 planes and boats covering a 56,000 square mile uh, search block for the Sarah Joe, but nothing was found. There was absolutely no trace of them. And so after five days, unfortunately, the Coast Guard called off the search. However, the, the people in their hometown in Nahiku, they knew these five men. These were incredibly capable, very experienced fishermen. They were all great swimmers. They believed that because they hadn't found a trace of them, that perhaps they were still alive out there. And so they, as a community, raised $50,000 to pay uh, private ships and planes to continue the search. So there was an extended search that went on for a couple more weeks that covered an even bigger swath of territory, but at the end still yielded no results. The people that were doing the searching were just baffled because when people go missing at sea, there's some indication a lot of times when they're just fishing basically right off the coast, there's some indication of what happened to them. It's rare that you would have 0% found. Absolutely no idea what happened to these these five fishermen. One year after their disappearance, the families and friends decide to host a memorial and mourn the loss officially uh, for their loved ones. It was believed at this point that they had all perished. 2,300 miles southwest of the Hawaiian Islands lies this tiny little stretch of, I guess you can call them islands, uh, called the Teongi Atoll. And these little tiny strips of land that were barely higher than sea level barely sustained any life. There was a couple scrub plants that took hold here and there, but there's no fresh water. 
the only the only recorded human life that's ever been there was during World War II. A number of uh, Japanese soldiers were stranded there briefly, but it is 200 miles from the nearest uh, inhabited land. It's very far from any major shipping lane. It's just a place that, as a human being, you don't want to go. In fact, it was actually considered when they were testing the atomic bomb, when the United States was, it was considered to be a great spot to test the atomic bomb because no one's there and no one's anywhere near it. So incredibly isolated. On September 10th, 1988, marine biologist John Naughton, along with four other crew members, descended upon the Taeyonggi Atoll. They were sent there by the Marshall Islands to find a suitable wildlife sanctuary for some sea turtles and seabirds. Within 30 minutes of arriving at the Atoll, John and his crew saw a, what looked like a skeleton of, of a boat, a, you know, a Boston whaler boat that was down on the, sh the shore. John was actually a resident of Maui, so he's from Hawaii, and he saw on the back of this kind of skeletal remains of this boat, the letters HA, which means it's registered in Hawaii. And so he's, he's intrigued because you know, we're 2,300 miles from Hawaii and he starts moving the sand away to, to get a better look to see if there's any more writing on the boat. And he, he makes out a couple of letters, an S, an R, an H, an O, an E, and he puts it together. He's like, this is the Sarah Joe. This is the boat that went missing nine years earlier. And the reason he knew it that quickly is because he was one of the people deeply involved in the search efforts to find these lost fishermen. He was like leading search groups. He was totally committed to finding them. And here he is in a crazy twist of fate, 2,300 miles away, almost a decade later, finding the boat. Now, the boat did not initially provide any sort of information about where the fishermen might be. Uh, there was nothing on it. It was just the wood, very degraded from water, wear and tear. Uh, but the crew decided that they would search the island and just kind of look around because perhaps the crew, even if it was years and years ago, maybe they landed here uh, and then they ultimately perished once they were here. So maybe we can find their remains or just some sign that they might have been here. John walks about a hundred yards away from the Sarah Joe and he sees what looks like kind of a crudely constructed cross out of driftwood. And below it, he can see that there's a bunch of rocks that have been placed definitely in some sort of decorative way and it looks it looks like a gravesite and considering what they're looking for he thinks there there's there there's the first of the bodies that we're going to find he calls over his crew and and so they begin kind of moving some things aside they don't want to totally disturb the grave just to be respectful but a little ways down the inside of the grave is not only bones uh, but they find this little book uh, the book had no writing in it and it's hard to even call it a book. It was more like a stack of papers. But on each page, there was a little square cutout of tinfoil that sat on the page. Basically, every page had a little square of tinfoil and nothing else to it. No one knew what it meant, uh, but undoubtedly, somebody had very clearly buried somebody else right here in a very shallow grave and had left this little book in here with uh, whoever was buried here. And so while John and a couple of his crew are looking at this book and trying to make sense of it, one of his crew members that was just kind of standing back looking at the site commented that, you know, the bones that are in that grave, they're not very bleached. Now, if, if a bone's been sitting for a long time, it will basically bleach and become totally white. Everything comes off the bone. These bones looked relatively fresh. So whoever was buried here, it, they had been buried recently. At this point, John and his crew have basically abandoned their, their kind of wildlife sanctuary research, and now they're just scouring this, this little scrub of land uh, in the Taonggye Atoll for any other signs of, you know, things that could have to do with the Sarah Joe crew, and they found nothing else. So uh, they report back to the Coast Guard and alert the Marshallese authorities that what was found on the island, and they send out a couple of forensic experts to examine the bone. They were able to determine that the bones in the grave belonged to Scott Mormon. When news got back to the Hawaiian mainland that Scott Mormon had been found, the family members of the other four fishermen that went missing on the Sarah Joe, they hired uh, private detectives to go scour the Taeyonggi Atoll, look everywhere, see if you can find our loved ones remains. And so 
this team of private detectives and a dive team and all these people are sent to the Taeyonggi Atoll and they look everywhere. They're digging up the sand. They have dive teams going out into the water. I mean, they are really leaving no stone unturned. And all they're able to find is the outboard motor of the Sarah Joe, which was a little ways off the coast from where the boat itself was found, wedged in some coral. Uh, and then they also found a handful of more bones on the beach near where that shallow grave where Scott Mormon was buried. But those bones also belong to Scott Mormon. So there was nothing else found of the other four fishermen or any indication of what happened uh, to the boat. There's nothing. And in fact, researchers that were able to look at the bones of Scott Mormon, there wasn't enough evidence there to help them determine a cause of death. So we don't even know how he passed away or when he passed away. However, it was determined just based on the bleaching of the bones that it was a, a relatively recent death. Uh, I don't know what the timeline is on that, but recent is the term that's used. While it was a very big deal that they located Scott Mormon's remains on the Taeyonggi Atoll, even though it was 10 years later, this is revelatory. This is a really big deal, not only for the families of the fishermen, but for anybody involved, this is a really big deal. But there was an additional revelation once Scott Mormon's bones were found that basically turned this case upside down. There's already a bunch of questions like who buried Scott Mormon? How did Scott Mormon become freshly buried almost a decade later? You know, how long had they been there? There's some basic questions that you're going to ask. But there's one fact that nobody seems to be able to reconcile. And that was six years after they went missing, the Marshall Islands conducted a government survey of the Taeyonggi Atoll, which would mean they scoured the islands, all those little, the little strips of land that make up the Taeyonggi Atoll. They scoured it just taking measurements and, and, and basically mapping out the Taeyonggi Atoll. I think it was in preparation for potentially turning it into this wildlife sanctuary. So they looked everywhere on that on the Taeyonggi Atoll six years after the Sarah Joe went missing. So they go missing. Six years later, there's this government survey of the Taeyonggi Atoll. And guess what? They ended up looking at that survey and there's no boat. There's no shallow grave, there's nothing. It's just an uninhabited strip of land, nothing else. There's no boats there. Experts, when this was revealed, uh, said that, well, had they, the Sarah Joe, the crew of the Sarah Joe, uh, gone dead in the water following the storm, they could have drifted the 2,300 miles to the Taeyonggi Atoll in roughly three months. But, they weren't there at the six year mark. So what were they doing between the disappearance and the six year mark, which would have been the earliest they could have arrived because prior to they would have been discovered during this audit. So you have a six year gap where no one can account for where they were. Even if they made it to the Taeyonggi Atoll six years in a day after they went, they had disappeared, that they had been somehow surviving in the open ocean for six years. And they just so happened to land at the Taeyonggi Atoll six years and a day later, basically they just, just after the survey's done, let's say they make it there. Who buried Scott Mormon? And what was the booklet that was buried with him with the tinfoil squares? This is a totally uninhabited stretch of land. There is no one there to perform any sort of burial ritual. Even if we're willing to say that maybe one of the other fishermen buried Scott Mormon, well then where are the other fishermen? Some people wonder, are they still alive? So like many of my videos, unfortunately, there isn't really a good conclusion here. It just kind of ends in a bunch of questions. But I would love it if you included in the comment section what you think could be the reason behind that six year gap. How can we account for those six years when they were not at the Taeyonggi Atoll? I mean, my suggestion would be maybe the survey wasn't done very well and they just missed it. Um, but that still doesn't also answer, well, who buried Scott Mormon? And also, why were his bones not so bleached? How did they, how did he come to be freshly buried nine years, nine and a half years after he disappeared? So lots of questions. I would love to hear your, your theories, your comments, your takeaways in the comments section. And, and again, if, if you like this video, please hit like, 
please click subscribe, turn on all notifications because I'm going to be posting stories like this one three, four times a week. I love doing this and I hope you'll come along. If you want to follow me on other social media channels, uh, my handle on Instagram is johnballin416 and I am Mr. Ballin, one word, on every other social media platform. Uh, I post quite a bit on TikTok, so you can check me out over there. That's going to do it, guys. I hope that was interesting and I look forward to reading your comments. See ya.